Ladies and gentlemen, if you choose to sort of join a certain organization where you get economic benefit, and then you start having monthly meetings to represent yourself and try to negotiate with your managers, that's a union. And that's exactly the kind of policy that they want to have in their side as well. So principally, they have no argument against people negotiating against their negotiating against their corporations or you know banding together to form collective action and to form critical mass to get social change and get improvement in their working conditions. Because their policy, ladies and gentlemen, just introduces a new form of a union where you silence any form of oppression, Mr. Speaker, for only economic benefits. When, so we reaffirm this debate, Mr. Speaker, it becomes incredibly messy because the principle coming from them is that you know, we should have economic benefits instead of have the other benefits like improved working conditions in our side of the house, ladies and gentlemen. So from that the get-go, we already take this debate because we have shown to you how unions are able to provide more benefits to individuals as compared to their policy. Because the only harm in their policy is that we have to join unions. But in our side, ladies and gentlemen, they have to join these policies as well. They have to opt in these things for them to accrue these kinds of benefits. So if they don't want to spend sure. time, then they still cannot attend these meetings. Yeah. It's still principally hard on their side of the house, so they can still attend the meetings at the end of the day. No, thank you. Okay, what are you talking about? Okay, talking sorry. about the idea of a union and how it forwards critical mass and how we this and it allows us to get more benefits as compared to the other side of the house. The form of three levels per bottle, but the form of one, go ahead. Why is it sensible for me to still join a union when in fact I'll only get 10,000 bucks as my, as my monthly wage? Well, if I don't, I'll get 15,000 bucks. Why does that make sense to me? Because first of all, opening government already conceded that unions are really successful in getting the range of wage increases, right? So I will be able to still get increase in wage even if I join a union or I do not subscribe to your policy. But besides having an increase in wage, we tell you the improved working conditions and you know, the right, workers' rights that the unions are able to fight for are absent in your side of the house where you only sell your money and you only get an increased amount of wages. Mr. Speaker, let's have a few levels of rebuttal first. Firstly, this is my opinion view of unions. Because I try to frame it as coming from government, you know unions are incredibly exclusive. And all unions only forward their own social causes. We tell you, ladies and gentlemen, for instance, labor unions who are already becoming legislative, have for, ask for legislative action to benefit all workers in the process, and not only the members of the union to begin with. So operating in their frame, ladies and gentlemen, only works when unions are incredibly selective and incredibly inclusive. They never able to engage in the frame coming from a partner, where you tell that unions are also able to fight for all labor rights in general. And so you have labor partners like by Luna, for instance, who are able to fight for labor rights in all, all across the board and not sure members of their union at the end of the day. But secondly, ladies and gentlemen, they tell us that we're forcing people to be part of the unions. No, we're not forcing that. If you do not want to take part in the collective action, you don't want to speak against your people, go ahead, right? But the difference, Mr. Speaker, is that their side of the house is the same thing. Because if you want, they tell us that if the only way for you to get social mobility, the only way to improve your working conditions is to join a union. Their side of the house is the same thing because the only way for you to do that is to join their policy or you to decide to reduce your right to go to the unions at the end of the day. No, thank you. But more than that, ladies and gentlemen, they have to respond to my partner's case, which already directly preempted that. Because we told you that in their side of the house, they permanently removed their right to actually join the union to begin with. So if you talk about the balancing of freedoms, it's in only in their side of the house where they no longer have that kind of freedom or no longer have that kind of option, especially when times change, ladies and gentlemen, and their employee employers become more abusive, employees employers become more exploitative in their kinds of methods. We say, ladies and gentlemen, that that's the kind of freedom, but it's the kind of forcing that they do after, you know, just for an increased wage. But lastly, ladies and gentlemen, let's deal with this idea on the divide between each other because, you know, we have less cohesion in the workplace. We say, ladies and gentlemen, it's also, again, not me too soon. But in their side of the house, it's the same logic that applies. There are people part of a union, and there are people who are part of their union that's not a union, ladies and gentlemen. We say, ladies and gentlemen, that there's this still divide that exists, but it's worse on their side. Why? Because in that kind of logic, ladies and gentlemen, these people have decided to sell, you know, the workers' welfare for monetary gain. So you get this entire idea of antagonization. Mr. Speaker, and members of the labor union will start hating these people even more because you know, they sell their rights to be negotiating as compared to if they just kept silent and did not try to become more passive at the end of the day. So, but more than that, ladies and gentlemen, you see that argument is like an argument against all unions in general because the fact that you have a union means that there's a divide in the social cohesion at the end of the day, right? We don't necessarily mean how it's exactly so bad in the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen. If that's the case, then they should be going against all unions in general. No, thank you. Okay, let's move on to my construction case then. On this idea of how we get critical mass and accrue more benefits. This will co up their benefits of, you know, these people who are not able to actually get the kind of benefits from unions at the end of the day. Ladies and gentlemen, the premise here is that labor unions require critical mass. Because the concept of a union comes from the idea that collective voice is stronger than an individual voice trying to go against his employer. And if people start striking, or one person starts striking, the employer won't care. But if a hundred people are 
4,000 people start striking, employer now sees a big problem. No, thank you. But second premise here is that reducing the numbers will harm the power of the union in general. Because inability, Mr. Speaker, because coming from the idea of the critical mass, when you start reducing, you try to incentivize, try to buy out the members, possible members of the union, the power of the collective power of the union starts weakening. You say, ladies and gentlemen, the third premise, no, thank you, this is the entire idea that this policy is this effective, will start, you know, reducing the number of members who are potentially going to the union. Why is this so harmful, right? Because number one, we say it generally weakens the power of the movement and uh, power of the union in general. So what? No, number, Mr. Speaker, we say that intuitively this harms the ability of the union to check the corporations. Meaning, if corporations start being evil, evil for instance, they start raising well, work, lowering working conditions, the ability for the movement or the ability for the union to start checking that because the critical mass is already critically lessened already weakens at the end of the day. But thank you. But secondly, ladies and gentlemen, because the poor of because the poor of wait, because the power of these unions weaken, it makes other members who will potentially join the movement, join the union, also let change your calculus. Why is it so, Mr. Speaker? Let's analyze the calculus of the worker. Because the fact that, you know, you're forced to make a concession, that, you know, these unions are starting to make, become weaker, right? So now I'm forced to join, on, you have to, I have to concede and compromise and try to get their policy because, you know, I realize that unions are becoming weaker and will never be effective yeah. at the end of the day. Mr. Speaker, we say that, number one, so what? This is a third party harm, right? Because it, in a bit, it neuters the choice of these individuals, not only those who are not part of the union, but those who potentially want to join the union at any day. But secondly, it curtails the choices of other people because, you know, yeah, yeah it curtails other choices of other people. But more than that, ladies and gentlemen, let's analyze the idea of a union versus their kind of things, right? Because you want the union to be powerful because the union provides more benefits than just higher wages. As compared to their set of the house, ladies and gentlemen, where the only thing I get is this representation and, you know, this entire idea of higher wages at the end of the day. So even even if, Mr. Speaker, we say that some of these people will have less in freedom because they're willing to buy such bullet because at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, unions will help increase wages all across the board. And even if they don't go all across the board, these members can join the union to help get the candidate benefits as well. We tell you, Mr. Speaker, that if their policy relies on them, you know, banding together, then that's exactly the kind of union that they're trying to go against. Mr. Speaker, at the end of the day, we have to realize that our policy or our model is gentlemen, gets the best of both worlds because we're able to get the benefits for most people, but at the same time, it's principally still wrong for us to be able to sell or move, or sell or sell our rights to the union. And because of that, ladies and gentlemen, Savior A is going to the court this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.